wonderful privilege and honor it is to be here with you this morning. And I'll tell you why. When I received the invitation, it was from Mr. A.J. Shaw. And for a teacher, for a student to invite you, that's the best thing that can happen. <laughs> I've been at SIU for over 20 years, and my home discipline is psychology. I started out as a faculty member, and I never imagined that I would be serving as an interim provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs. I always loved being in the classroom, spending time with my students, talking to them about psychology, getting them excited and passionate about the discipline. But in my current role, I, I don't see that stopping. Uh, this is about serving the students. And so I'm really pleased, and I'm actually very impressed to see so many students up here early in the morning on a Saturday. <laughs> so, so round of applause to our students. Yeah. <laughs> and then I want to take a moment to welcome back our former students. <laughs> this is a labor of love for you to come back to join us this morning. And I, I've talked to s several of you. I understand that many of you have been coming back every year, and you truly you know, appreciate that passion, that spirit with which you come back. So this is something I want to share with you. In my journey through various administrative positions, I served as a chair of psychology, I served as the associate dean, and then the dean of the College of Liberal Arts at SIU, and then as a provost. So what is the difference in all of these roles, and what do I see, and why am I saying this now? Is that as the provost, I see all the different colleges. So we have eight academic colleges. And this is what stands out for the College of Agriculture. is the spirit of a family. Whether it's current students, the faculty, or the alumni, is that you know, all sort of embracing attitude of helping and supporting each other. So I really want to recognize that. I don't always see it in other colleges. I served as a dean. I went out and met many alumni in the College of Liberal Arts, but I didn't get that same feeling. That's very special, that's very unique. I hope you sort of uh, keep it going, that, you know, that passion and that flame for your uh, discipline, for your college. And I really want to thank all the alumni from the bottom of my heart. In these 10 months as a provost, I've gone to many ag events. And you have something special. I would encourage students to stay connected with your alumni. They are a fantastic network for you a source of professional advice. I looked up the uh, Alpha Gamma Rho, the main official website, as well as the Beta Alpha website, and I noticed that your motto or the goals are leadership, responsibility, and integrity. And those are very powerful words. And I hope that with your interactions with your alumni, who are members of you know, the uh, fraternity, that you will continue to pursue these goals in the careers that you might pursue. Also, note that these alumni come back because they are paying it forward. During their days when they were students, there were alumni who came before them, who supported them in various ways. It could be in terms of advice, mentoring, of, you know, encouragement, uh, opening doors for you providing scholarship support, whatever it might be. In some way, you were supported by your alumni. And I hope that you know you keep these thoughts in mind as you go forward and make your own careers and think of SIT. So having said that, uh, I think Mr. Shaw asked me if I would uh, talk about like the state of the university. And so uh, let me share with you things uh, that might be relevant to you or of interest to you, because there's so much that I can tell you, but I have only a few minutes. One thing I want to assure you is that great things are happening in SIU. Despite what you might read in the news, <laughs> despite what you might hear, despite what might be anecdotal evidence, someone might tell you, oh, you know what happened, and then tell you something, I hope you'll close your ears and listen to something else beyond that. After you've had that conversation, then listen. Great things are happening in SIU. And I'm not just saying it, uh, you know, in ignorance. I'm saying it because I know what's happening on our campus. We've had a few turbulent years. I'm acknowledging that. I'm not saying, you know, we haven't gone through some rough times. We've gone through some rough, rough times, but we see something positive ahead of us. We are positioning ourselves for a better tomorrow. 
This year, we will be celebrating on March 6, 150 years of our existence. A very proud and rich history. And we are positioning ourselves for the next 150 years. We are not going away. We are not closing our doors. We are not shutting down our programs. We are reshaping ourselves. We are preparing and positioning ourselves for students who are in high school now, in the eighth grade now, in the fourth grade now, entering kindergarten now. We want to be relevant to them. So what we are doing is we are planning ahead. We have short-term and long-term goals. And we're doing things that we have not been doing very well over the last few years. And when I reference the turbulent years, we've had some turbulence in leadership. But we are changing that. This semester, we have a chancellor in place who is fantastic for us. He knows the region, and I'm referencing Chancellor John Dunn. He knows the region, he knows the university, he served as a provost here for five years, and he knows his job. He was the president at Western Michigan for 10 years, successful years. He was retained an extra year to help the next person transition in. So he brings all that knowledge and wisdom and is helping us move forward. I've been at SIU for over 20 years and I'm very dedicated and passionate about what I do. So you are in good hands. So what are we doing? First and foremost, we have replaced or rather hired an empty position and that is our Associate Chancellor for Recruitment and Extension. We're firing from all engines. We're doing everything possible at the regional, national, and international level to bring more students to our campus. That's in terms of recruitment. But that's not the only answer. We're also doing everything possible on retention. The Chancellor has sort of captured what we've been doing in these words. These are his taglines. It's personal. Each and every one of us is making it personal that we are here to serve our students. We are here to make you successful in every way possible. Not only are we going to offer you and doing our best to offer you the best academic experience. So for example, I'll give you an example of little things that we're doing to ensure that you have a fantastic academic experience. One is that we want to make sure that our teachers are doing the best job in the classroom that we are scheduling classes that will help you take the classes that you need so that you can graduate in a timely manner, that we provide you internships and hands-on experiences that will make you stand out when you graduate against the competition. And this is where our alumni can really help us, is network us, help our students to find us. And we're doing everything possible on all those fronts to make these things. We're not expecting the student to come in and figure it out on their own. We are helping them make these passes. So in that sense, we're delivering that excellent academic experience, helping students be poised for success. And we hope that you know, that word of mouth will help most students come to us. We are hiring new faculty. We entered fall 2018 during the turbulent years with zero hires. That is kind of like the kiss of death for an academic institution. This fall, we'll be hiring 25 new faculty. And we're getting, and I've asked the deans to submit the hiring plans on March 16th for fall 2020. So we are not going away, we are growing. We have a special unique events that we have not had before. For example, last semester, we had SIU Day, where we invited all the area high schools within an hour's distance and offered them transportation if they didn't have a bus or paying their drivers if they couldn't afford that. So that's good. And we had 22 high schools participate, 600 students on our campus. This semester, on April 26, we are repeating the event, but going two hours and offering that kind of support so that they can bring the students. So this is just local, but we're also doing things nationally and internationally. For example, two or three weekends ago, we had 325 students on our campus who had an ACT of 25 and above, sorry, 28 and above. We had a fantastic event, and we are doing our best to have a 100% yield rate we want to bring all the students. We're following up with phone calls, letters, and persuading them, this is a place for you. Dean Midden mentioned that this fall, we had a very strong, it, it might seem like, okay, you know, you had 1,100, that, that enrollment has gone down. We could very easily have admitted another 200 or 300 students whom we denied 
admission to. Because we had the strongest academic profile of students coming in. And the faculty told me that. Again, that, this is anecdotal, but faculty said students are coming to class, they're attending, they're doing well on the exams, they're more engaged. Housing told me more students are coming for breakfast than have ever in the past. What does that tell you? Things are going well. <coughs> and we are consciously, carefully selecting students who we know will be successful. And we're doing our best to provide additional services for students. Now, this is broadly in terms of the university. I know that within the College of Agriculture, I've attended several of the FFA events, that every effort is being put to bring students with related interests on our campus and you know, show them what we have to offer. And anyone who comes on our campus will tell you, hands down, you don't even need to take a vote, we are the best looking campus in the state of Illinois. <laughs> Where else would you be able to walk through the woods to the library or take a walk around the lake? Our recreation center is one of the best. People are blessed here at Loma, you don't know what you have. This past year, we've had one of the highest giving rates for alumni, I think like about 25% up in terms of alumni support. And why will our alumni support us? Because they see something positive happening on our campus. There are upcoming events that we didn't mention that I'll just sort of echo. We have the day of giving on March 6th, and that really is a special day to get first time supporters. We also will uh, commemorate the event with a, a book about the 150 years of SIU. I think like the title is Saluki Tradition, Pride and Promise, edited by John Jackson. And we also will have on March 30th the big event, which is a Saluki Day of Service, entirely run by students. On the model set up at the Texas A&M campus, where students gather together to serve the community. And that is something that is also our hallmark, is that we're not just a university. We are a part of a larger region, a larger community. We have received tremendous amount of support from our community members. Our previous chancellor, Montemania, who passed away last semester, was very active in co connecting with all the community members. And that's where I was yesterday, just representing SIU at an SIH event. SIH has come forward and has promised to help us with the, our SIU uh, day on April 26th. They're helping us with our academic program. They're helping us support mount a new uh, bachelor's in nursing program, which we just got permission and we <coughs> uploaded the uh, notice of intent yesterday to the Illinois Board of Education. So we are expecting to have a bachelor's in nursing program. And that has taken a lot of hard yeah. work yeah. by a lot of people. <laughs> That's why yesterday yeah. I said, okay, I have to go and represent <laughs> SIU and thank them for our support. So with this, I want to stop uh, and let you know that my words are based in reality. We are facing tough times. Higher education is changing. And it's our job to read the environment and see how we can adjust to it. The students of today, who, who come are different from the students who came 30 years ago. How are we positioning ourselves to serve their needs? And we are doing just that. Thank you. Mayor, I have one observation because you're the point person for this is the points of pride, the Saluki yes. points of pride. Yes. You might make people aware of that because I think yes. that changes the messaging as well. Yes. I mean, I would welcome suggestions in, in the way in terms of how we can reach out. Uh, you know, we, we are trying to send it to conferences. Uh, I've had um, some of our alumni and friends of SIU reach out to me for it. I've given it to them. And we, you know, we continuously update it because there are so many fantastic things about us. So you know, just as a point of pride, you may not realize it. You're sitting here saying, I'm a graduate student in the College of Agriculture. But you know that there are 4,000 universities and colleges in the United States. And there are only 200 plus that are high research universities. We are one of them. Hmm. There, there are even fewer, that number I don't remember today, that have a school of medicine and a school of law in the same campus. It's very rarefied company 
We are among that. Take pride in that. It influences us in many ways, provides us many opportunities. We are a research university. We don't always brag enough about that, what that tells you, what that really means for you. You know these 25 faculty that we are hiring this fall? We are hiring them because not only will they teach them the knowledge that they have, they'll be creating that knowledge. Their research will create new theories that others are learning about. So we are selecting people who are the best in the field and they'll bring that knowledge to your classroom and teach you. That's what it means, a research university is that they not only just teach what they know, but they create what others will know. So you are part of that university. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, this is a kind of a question of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Yeah. As you look at the uh, enrollment and the recruiting effort, and some would say that in order to increase in recruitment, increase enrollment, you've got to have that strong, uh, numerous faculty. Mm -hmm. And so, and that takes money. So I'm glad to hear that, that we're getting new faculty, 25 new yes. positions. I hope several of those come into the College of Ag. But we do have a lot of vacancies. <laughs> so in, in terms of like the, uh, the point about having more faculty so we can have more students, uh, I will not sort of, uh, say that that's not completely true, but I'd say that look at it for, as a layered thing. So I had uh, 100 requests for faculty hires. We couldn't afford all of them right away, so we made some strategic choices, okay, 25, where there is high areas of growth, where right now they're turning students away because they can't, they don't have enough staff. So that's where they're gonna fill right away, but we're not ignoring the others. And then I've also told the uh, deans, bring me interdisciplinary hires. So if you have a hole over here and a hole over here, and we can't fill up both, can you come with a hire that can partially fill those two? So that it's not like we fill one and the other one is like empty. So pick an interdisciplinary hire that can cover the two partially, so there's some relief. So that's the tenure track faculty hire. I've also told deans that if you have some needs, we will hire what I call like stop gap, like the adjunct faculty, because what I do, the budget that I have, I keep some for tenure track because that's recurring money will just go there. And then you have some money where you say, okay, for stop gap needs, sudden needs, someone leaves, someone dies, someone, you know, things happen, so we have to have that. So we are not going to like ignore and not fill the forces, but we're going to do that. But we're going to do it in a strategic way. question. Uh, in, in terms of how the giving might help, there are many different ways. So for example, in these top students that we have, we will offer 25 students a full ride for four years, and the then another 75% that would get the uh, university excellence. So that is like three-fourths of a ride. And we try to offer the other, like the dean's scholarship, so that we try to give everyone. But in particular, something that uh, I want to mention that the foundation was able to help us is that we have many students, say like, for example, this semester, seniors who are close to graduating, but they can't register because they have a bursa or hold. They owe some money. So the foundation has given us money so we can serve these students and pay that bursa or hold so they can take the classes and graduate. And we may not be able to help all the students, but then we look at, okay, the high achieving students who can perform really well, but they have some financial difficulties, so we're supporting them. So some of the foundation money is helping us with that. Now some, of that <coughs> some of that money comes through the Alumni Association. Yes, so yeah, both the foundation and, and, and the alumni. That help uh, encourage all of you to join the Alumni Association. <laughs> <laughs> there are many in a different ways in which we're able to serve our students here. Any questions from the students? I guess I've been the first to be over. This is your <laughs> shot. Get it in. Get it in, guys. I, I, I have a question. Um, in meeting with you one time, um, 
knowing that we have so many positions that are interim, um, yeah. you can know we're marching ahead and we're making yeah. good decisions. As we're looking at what needs to be replaced, uh, are pretty much everything until we get a president on hold or get, give us a little sure. tracking here. Yeah. So the question is, you know, why, what are we doing about like the many interim positions and how does that affect us? So uh, uh, you're remembering the, the answer that I gave you. He asked me, you're the interim provost. Uh, will you behave like an interim, which is like just you know, status quo? And I said, I'm, I'm already doing things. I'm already making tough decisions, uh, which you know, could, you know, some people may be angry with me, but I'm doing that because I'm, I'm in the job. I'm doing it. I'm not doing it half-hearted like an interim. I'm doing it like the actual person. So in response to your question, there are a couple of things that I want to touch on. First of all, the title interim is not that we are not sure. It is the process by which the person is selected. You might be aware that we have various unions on our campus. So there are, there are certain rules and regulations that we have to follow in terms of hiring. So for example, if you do a national search, which can take a year and you select somebody, going through the whole formal process, that would be the permanent. So when I became dean, I was dean. I was not interim dean because we went through the whole process. It took a year and I was selected through a national search. Now, after I became the provost, because I was placed, the chancellor asked me, will you be the provost? I was appointed, that's I'm interim. Now, if you're going to do a national search, you have to take a year, and then the person who comes in would be the permanent provost. Now, when I became the provo interim provost, the, we had to fill that position immediately in a short period of time. We can't leave it vacant because I was doing both jobs for several weeks, several months actually, till the interim was selected through an in internal process. So because we didn't do a national search and select somebody, which we plan to do, the person who selected then is an interim. But they are making all the tough decisions. They are <coughs> running the college. So that might explain that. So in terms of our president, we right now have an interim president mm -hmm. because we didn't do that search. But right now, the Board of Trustees has already selected a search firm. And the search firm has already got all the applicants. As, a, as I speak today, they've put together the search committee. Just last week, somebody told me that from the Faculty Senate and Grad Council that they were getting calls to send nominees to be on the search committee. So there is an active search committee that's being formed. And then, uh, so the expectation is by fall 19, we'll have a permanent president. We have an interim chancellor because the logic is the president should select the chancellor. So they get along <laughs> with each other. They're all on the same page. And a chancellor knows who the president is, who their supervisor boss is going to be. So we're hoping by fall 2020 to have a permanent chancellor in place. If that's helpful. Very good. <laughs> What's the timeline with the uh, reorganization that once upon a time was going to involve the College of Agriculture and the College of Life Sciences? Is it, is it still going? Is it in flux? Is it stalled out? Yeah, so in terms of the reorganization, uh, Ch Chancellor Montemani, when he started, he had a certain timeline. Now, we haven't been able to meet that timeline because we are a very large university with lots of colleges, with hundreds of faculty who have you know, opinions and, and ideas, and we want to include and collaborate with them. So it's taken time. So we're going through that process of shared governance in terms of the entire reorganization process. Right now, there are seven RMEs for seven schools that are under review with the Illinois Board of Higher Education. Uh, last, in, in December, the Board of Trustees uh, passed a resolution to support the reorganization of the university. And following that, we submitted seven to the Illinois Board of Higher Education. It, it involves a 60-day review, and that we have kind of come to that point. We checked in last week with the IBHE saying, have you completed the review? And they said, we are doing that. We'll get back to you. If those are approved, you will have seven schools ready to go. We have a second batch of schools that did not receive a major, those were the ones that received a majority support from the faculty senate, the grad council. We have a second batch that did not receive that full support, but the majority support. But the chancellor has now asked, because it's taken him, he's been here six weeks, uh, he's had to figure out what's going on. He's asked to meet with all that, all the faculty in those second batch, and then he's going to make a decision whether we're going to move forward or what we're going to do. So that's up to him and, and, and the discussions that we have. And then we have several other proposals that are coming faculty driven for the remaining de departments on our campus, what they, how they want to reorganize. And the bottom line for the reorganization, if you're wondering why you reorganize it, why can't you just let it be? If any of you have, you know, so ha ha have the experience of running a place, you realize that there are costs 
and then there's revenue. You have to make sure that you do your best. If your revenue is not coming in, you have to cut your costs somewhere. So we're trying to tighten ourselves so that we have fewer costs. That is in tune with the revenue that we're generating. On the one hand, we're trying really hard to generate more revenue, get more from the state. Our revenue comes from the state, whatever the state appropriates to us, and the tuition from the students that they pay. Those are our main sources. Alumni support is a third, and any grant activity that faculty bring in, that is a fourth area of support. So the reorganization is addressing that economic problem that we have on this campus, is how do we run such a large university with the money that we have? Particularly the year that the state did not give us any money and then came back and gave us 30%. But forever we lost that 70%. Forever. We never got it, but we ran the university. And then the following year they came back and gave us 20% less. So you know, the, all of these things, we have to make decisions, we have to keep running the university and still deliver the best academic experience for our students. So the reorganization was not about uh, realignment and getting focus or even buddy breathing with, with weaker departments to keep them alive, it was about costs. Cost was one of the variables, but as we're addressing the cost, you can't just willy nilly and say, okay, we don't have any money, so all of you go away. We say, okay, <laughs> how are we going to do this? We have to cut, but let's use this as an opportunity also because we were realizing, I mean, the students who are here can attest to this. The students who are coming to us are coming with 20 and 30 college credits already done. They're double majoring and triple minoring, telling us with that decision, what you're offering, your old boxes are not enough. I can't just take one major and I'm satisfied. I need two majors, triple minors. I'm looking for something more. And that's what the reorganization is allowing us to do, is to bring similar disciplines together and think synergistically. The granting agencies who are giving out the grants are telling us, if you have an interdisciplinary team, we will give you the grant. I recently connected somebody from science, somebody from business, because they, they, their grant will be more like quantum physics and information science with information systems in business. I connected them because I know they'll be more successful in getting that grant. And that grant will support a faculty member's salary for three years in quantum physics. So that's telling, and not just quantum, quantum physics and information science, that granting agency is saying, that's the field of tomorrow. We will support it by giving you money to hire somebody. Will you support them with, you know, after three years, our, our, our office has to pay them. So that's what the reorganization is allowing us to, to do is have that synergy so we can teach in a more interdisciplinary way and we can do research in a more interdisciplinary way. That's what the reorganization is allowing us to do. Bring similar programs together, like computer science and information system technology are looking at each and saying, okay, we can work together and offer cyber security, which we didn't offer before, because we need both pieces to do that. I have a lot more things to say, but I know that the uh, speaker is here, so I'm just trying to control myself. <laughs> there are many other examples I can give of interdisciplinary that the reorg is allowing us to do. And you might hear from faculty who don't support it, but I also hear from the faculty who are asking me, Mira, what's taking so long? <laughs> they have been wanting to reorganize even before the chancellor had come. But they have to go through the steps and this process and then IBHE and the BOT and the, you know, all those acronyms, they don't care, they want to get going. Right, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.